Hello everyone, Michael Kummer here and Alessandro. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We know this uh, webinar has been long overdue. Uh, we've had some issues, technical issues, and then our uh, presenter uh, wasn't available, but finally we, we made it happen. So today we're gonna talk about, or Alessandro is gonna talk about HR-driven identity lifecycle management in SAP, cloud identity access governance, or AIG. I know that's a mouthful, but Alessandro will break it down for you. Make sure we all know what it exactly means and mm -hmm. how you can leverage that. Uh, before we get started, as always, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is going to be recorded, so we, you will receive a link to the recording directly from GoToWebinar as well as from our friendly Sean. Uh, he's probably going to follow up either later today or tomorrow with a link to the recording and uh, asking if you have any questions that uh, we might may not have been able to answer during the webinar. Um, there is also a questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. So if you wanna ask us any questions um, during the webinar, feel free to do so, just type it in. We'll keep an eye on that. And then towards the end, Alessandro will uh, answer as many questions as we can, um, depending on how much time we have left. Anything that we can't answer, however, we'll try to answer offline and follow up with an email. So as long as you type in your questions and send them to us, we'll make sure we get uh, the answers. And uh, with that being said, I'm gonna hand it over to Alessandro and he's gonna walk you guys through the webinar today. Perfect, thank you, Michael. Welcome everyone. Um, as Michael already said, today we're going to talk about uh, SAP IHE or SAP Cloud Entity Access Governance. I'll just refer to it as IHE, much uh, smaller and shorter and faster to say than the entire product name. Um, this is kind of like a continuation, as Michael said, of the series we had like a year ago that we called the uh, SAP uh, cloud security madness that we had last year um, and so it's a one webinar that we, we unfortunately couldn't do right away because of you know some issues we had with IHE with success factors it finally got together and you know everything is working so I'm now very happy to be able to show you this because this is a very interesting topic we had a lot of um, questions from you guys also from some other um, and when we had trainings and workshops there's always a question that came up how can we handle the yeah, the HR driven or the, the HR process that you guys all know from from access control if you have used the HR trigger in the past so that's basically what we're uh, trying to look um, at today I have a, a live demo plan we can see it here from the agenda so maybe just uh, at first of just a few minutes just maybe one minute about who we are what we do I can see we have a couple of new uh, people uh, that joined the webinar and then we do quickly a quick overview again about IHE some of you might not know all the details. I mean, we had a lot of webinars about IHE already, but just very briefly talk about what IHE offers from a services perspective, what's the architecture behind IHE, and then what are the possible integration scenarios um, when it comes to that HR-driven identity lifecycle management that can be achieved with IHE. As I said, I haven't um, really prepared anything in the slides, so I really wanna go into the, the system to show you that IHE actually works and that we can achieve uh, those type of, of, of lifecycle uh, workflows. And so the most of the, or the, the good chunk of the presentation will be directly in the system. For those of you that don't know us, um, Exciting has been around since 2008. We've been founded back in, in Switzerland. Um, we have offices throughout Europe. We're in the US since 2016, um, growing globally. We have over hundred employees uh, today. We have different certifications and, and uh, partner statuses with SAP. We're our SAP Gold Partner. We have different recognized expertise certifications. One uh, that I mentioned here, particularly in the area of uh, governance risk compliance. Um, we also offer not only consulting and consulting services, trainings, and workshops to our customers. We also offer software solutions. All our software solutions are also fully SAP certified for the integration with, with uh, SAP S for HANA, specifically with S for HANA Cloud. So that's a, a very big achievement for us as a, I would say, a relatively small company to have that, um, in, you know, impactful certifications. Also, what we do um, as uh, as a, a company in general, we work very closely with SAP, especially in the area of education. We do a lot of trainings for SAP. You know, when it comes to the entire uh, SAP security portfolio from GRC, IDM, Rosen Authorizations Management, Subfiori, S for HANA migration, single sign on, and so on. So basically, we cover that entire um, SAP security portfolio and also, you know, obviously consult and train our, our customers and potential customers on those topics. 
as a company, we kind of work around, I would say, four different um, um, topics. Uh, obviously, one that we're talking about today as well in the area of access governance and compliance, where we offer obviously different tools throughout, but then obviously also different um, you know, consulting services when it comes to, for example, specifically when we talk about IHG or sub access control consulting services in the area of you know implementing access control, configuring, enhancing whatever you can think of um, that you do with the systems, we can also provide services around that and help you with that. We do other topics in the area of security monitoring. You know, we have tools that help us achieve real-time security monitoring in your landscape um, with you know different type of alerting that go beyond just roles and authorizations or or even beyond what, what just a, a traditional GRC solution offers you know, when it comes to parameter monitoring, system system log monitoring and so on. So we also have uh, a huge portfolio in that area. And then obviously most of you guys know us from the authorizations management side where we have different tools, particularly the exciting authorizations management suite, which is widely known, where we you know, automate, simplify and help you guys manage um, authorizations in SAP more efficiently um, you know, with our tools. And then also certain capabilities in the area of identity access management. Don't want to spend too much time here. We're here to uh, talk about IHE, so let's focus on that. <laughs> um, again, IHE, identity access governance, that's the, the topic here. So it's all about managing identities, managing access governance. IHE, very important, offers similar capabilities to what sub access control offers, but it's not a replacement for access control. So it's not the, the next level of of access control is not IHE. IHE is an own product. It's entirely new development from SAP side. It's a cloud solution. It's a, a SaaS solution, software as a service that we can consume as a as a as a customer. But from a from a content perspective and from a functionality perspective, it's very similar to what access control offers. Obviously, we have similar services. They're named a little bit differently. We're used to that as well if we've been in the market for, for a little bit longer. So we basically have the same services as we have in access control. We have access analysis where we have you know, our, uh, our rule set where we can analyze user uh, uh, for, for SOD, critical access perspective. We can do mitigations, we can manage mitigations and so on. We have a role design service which, is, um, which allows us to uh, define business roles in particular where we can you know that we can then use in the access request um, service to provision end users that so we can you know uh, basically have a, a level on top of the technical roles to you know provision um, access at the end of the day more efficiently you know across across systems that means across um, on pre on premise systems but also across uh, you know and if you have a hybrid landscape between cloud applications and on premise applications it obviously off also offers different types of access certification uh, capabilities especially in the area of user access review very similar to what we have in 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 access control it's named a little bit differently the approach is a little bit different but at the end of the day it's the same capability you know the goal and, and what we need as a, or you as a customer at the end of the day, you know, need is a review of access, a review of the, of the roles and authorizations assigned to the end users. And last but not least, also then the firefighting, it's uh, it got renamed now, it's called Privileged Access Management or PAM. It's very similar to the firefighter capabilities in access control. I have to say, to be more specific, the same capabilities as the ID-based firefighter in access control. It's also only available for um, APA, for the APA world. There's no uh, firefighter capabilities today for, for cloud applications that doesn't exist uh, today. Um, different initiatives in that direction, but today um, as, as it stands, you know, the firefighter capabilities only available for, for APA on-premise applications. So all in all, all in all, very similar to access control. Um, obviously the the application looks different because it's a, it's an entirely new application. It's in the cloud. It's it's you know software as a service, as I said. That also means that we cannot configure and customize as much as we were able to in access control. So from a flexibility perspective, we're a little bit more limited because you know obviously with a with a with a SaaS solution, we can subscribe to services, and that also means they have to be packaged and they have to be or they have to work for all the customers that are on that 
on that on that cloud application because you know that's that's the the, the benefit and the the pro of, of having a cloud solution from an architecture perspective um, what's important here is that IHE as I mentioned it's not going to replace access control as a one-to-one -one replacement however it has very similar capabilities and for one or the other customer it might be very uh, legit to replace access control with IHE it comes down to really what you knew what you need from access control and you know what you're going to need going forward for customers that have a more complex landscape and have more complex requirements and need the flexibility that access control offers but then also need the um, availability and the connectivity into the cloud to provision cloud solution to um, um, analyze access in the cloud then we can use what's called a IHE bridge scenario. So we can basically use access control together with IHE. That also ultimately means that you as a customer, you require access control and you also require IHE. And then we can connect the two to you know, manage the entire um, hybrid landscape. And how does that work? Very simple, um, in, or not very simple, but it can be very simple at the end of the day. If you have something like an access control, that is already in place. Your users are you know, working with access control today. If we achieve and implement that IHE bridge scenario, at the end of the day, what happens is that down here in access control, pretty much everything will remain the way it was. We're extending certain capabilities with the cloud. So let's say in access control, you also want to manage user accounts. Um, and you want to use the, the provisioning workflows for cloud solutions, for example, Ariba, Field Class, Success Factors, S for HANA, you know, if you have a public cloud, and so on. At the end of the day, with the bridge scenario, what we can do is we can connect those systems in access control as an additional connector that goes through IHE. But the workflows, the you know, how you request roles, how you approve roles, all that will remain down here in access control on your on your on-premise installation. The cloud connectivity goes through the IHE and, and through, the, through the cloud services um, at the end of the day where you know provisioning risk analysis for the cloud will happen from directly from up here from IHE against the cloud applications. Your on-premise world like your S4 HANA on-premise, your CRM, your BW, your all your NetViewer installations you have, your sub HANA databases, they will, they, will, they will remain to be managed directly out of access control. And that ultimately allows us to have and, and, and have the capabilities to centrally from one instance manage the hybrid landscape when it comes to the identity and access governance requirements. That's kind of like where I want to get started. Now, obviously in IHE, very similar to access control, we have um, provisioning workflows where we can request access, access in form of either um, <coughs> a technical role, single roles, composite roles, um, but then obviously also the business roles. And in the in IHE, the favorable the favorable way forward is using business roles, especially because you know in the hybrid landscape we want to make sure that um, you know we simplify that process and you know especially for a lot of customers nowadays we're going down the route of you know having a job based a function based um, role concept or approach to roles and you know that's ultimately with, with the business roles makes a lot of sense and so that basically also means that from a access provisioning perspective we can always and that's um, available out of the box we can request access for myself i can request access for someone else all that from a manual approach is possible now on top of that what we now really want to talk about is that hr driven approach where we have an hr system which in the cloud obviously would be uh, success factors and and then basically have that hire to retire process managed out of of of, of success factors and let's talk about this i try to simplify as much as possible so everyone can follow here so basically what we're trying to achieve is that we have the the hire the job change and the fire or the termination process covered that ultimately means if we just let's just simply talk about the the new hire if we have a new employee starting when the new employee starts we want to make sure that there are user accounts in all the applications the user needs whether that's on premise could be access in 
in, in sub access control, could be accessed in IHE, could be accessed in the S4HANA system, can be accessed anywhere. And that's ultimately something we want to have provisioned. We want to make sure the user is created and then you know, standard roles or default roles are automatically assigned. The assignment of, rule, of, of roles and authorizations can go through an approval process. So that we can you know, include risk analysis, SOD checks, depending on how far we want to go with it HR driven. That's all part of the process flow that we want to achieve. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the provisioning happens natively. We don't want to be involved. It should be automated. We don't want to be manually involved to you know, create a user on the on-premise application in the cloud. That's all should happen automatically. For a lot of customers, and from what I've seen over the years, depending on how you're using the, the HR trigger today, very often we're starting out small, where we just say, hey, the first requirement is really just, let's get those, those user IDs created. Let's make sure we have the user accounts in all the systems and we provision base, you know, basic authorizations that every user gets along with the user account. So when the user starts, they at least have a username, they get a password, they can log on, ideally with singles and on where they don't have a password, and they already have a base access to access the applications. That's usually how most companies start. And then, you know, gradually we're ever adding on to that and we say, hey, actually when someone starts, I already want to have, you know, a rule-based role assignment. So if I know the job that the user is starting, I want to make sure that the user gets the access that we built for that job. That's kind of when we talk about the rule-based assignment and all that should go automated. I don't want to have anyone, you know, going into access control or IHE and start that process manually. It should happen automatically whenever our HR department adds a user, when we have a hire, that the process starts automatically out of the system. And that's basically what we want to achieve also with IHE. We had that in the past with the HR trigger in access control in a very similar fashion. Now it's also available for success factors. I just talked about the new hire. My demo that I have prepared really is just for the new hire process, but obviously then also for you know, job changes, we want to do certain things. For termination, we want to do certain things. Terminations are probably the easiest because we just want to delete the user, right? We want to make sure when an employee leaves the company that the user accounts get terminated in the entire landscape, not just in one system, in the entire landscape. And that's probably the easiest uh, process of all of them. And that's basically what we want to automate. Um, so basically what, what, what I wanted to point out here once again, if you are not on IHE yet, but you're considering, but you have access control. Access control natively integrates with sub success factors. So sub SAP success factors is the only cloud application that we can directly connect to sub access control. Okay, so if you don't have IHE and you wanna achieve this, the, at the end of the day, the same as I'm going to show you today with IHE, you can also do the very same things directly with access control. You don't need IHE for what I'm going to show you today. You're going to use or you're going to need IHE as soon as you're trying to connect cloud applications other than success factors. So if you have an Ariva, a Concur, Analytics Cloud, B2B application, and so on, then you require IHE. If you just have success factors today, then you can achieve the same things also with access control. And also, if you directly integrate, you can do risk analysis. So there's a rule set that you can maintain in access control. You can do the entire user provisioning workflows and obviously also HR triggers. So in, in sub access control, you can have an HR trigger from success factors or from sub HCM, both work. Um, now let's just very quickly talk about the different approaches. And you know this is just important to understand depending on where you are, I think there's like three approaches and I, I really simplified them to the minimum. There's a lot of things that we could add in between, uh, but really just try to simplify as much as possible. When we talk about the HR driven integration, let's say you're, you're only going to have an, an IHE, then obviously that scenario is possible. And here you can see in a very simple fashion, we have sub success factors, we have the HR events that we saw before, hire to retire, once again. If one of these happens, it goes over to IHE, then IHE has different rules that process that HR event 
and create an access request. We would then here have approval workflows, manager approval, role owner approval. We would do the risk analysis, you know, for SOD conflicts for critical access. That's fully or that's to some extent fully uh, customizable. What we want and what not. And once that's um, finally approved, then the provisioning will happen directly out of IEG for cloud applications, if you have them in scope, and also to the backend system to my on-premise world, you know, whether that's a HANA database, whether it's a NetViewer, business suite, whatever we have back here will be automatically provisioned. So this is the scenario where I as a customer, I just have IEG, I have success factors. Now, obviously, it can get more, way more complicated, especially if you have multiple success factors, which is, is, is truly possible. Then, you know, in between here, we would have something like uh, uh, SAP Master Data Integration, MDI, to, to manage that, and so on. So that's, that's, you know, we can, we can drive this to a complexity level, which is very hard to understand. So really try to simplify as much as possible, but there's different ways possible, obviously, as well. So this is the cloud-only approach. If you have, and I think this is probably, and I would assume most of you guys, you already have a sub access control, and you're trying to, you know, look at the next step. What, you know, because the requirement is to connect cloud applications. You now have uh, success factors. You know, HCM is going away, or partly it's going to success factors, and that's the requirement. So a lot of a lot of customers are in 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 this scenario where. You know, we, we're looking into IHE and we're connecting it with the IHE bridge scenario. So this is basically the IHE bridge. Um, how can this happen? How would we connect this? We have still success factors where we have the HR events. Instead of them going into IHE, they will go into access control. We then have the workflows that run in access control. Again, all the provisioning, uh, all the approvals from role owners, from managers, the uh, the uh, risk analysis, all that will remain in access control. That also ultimately also is where the user, the end users will log on from an approval pr uh, perspective. And once finally approved, then access control takes care of the provisioning. Back at the on-premise backend systems are directly provisioned out of access control. And if it's cloud applications, it goes through the IHE bridge and then basically from IHE into the cloud applications. And this basically means that, you know, the request, the HR, HR driven request that's happening will run directly in access control. And then ultimately also, I just wanted to here uh, show it as well, just for completeness. If you don't have IHE, but you know, maybe you're looking into that in the future, then as I said, this is also possible where you can natively integrate success factors with access control, but then you can see it up here. The only cloud application you can provision is success factors. Then you know, you cannot do anything with Concur, Ariba, all the others. For that, if I go one, one, one slide back, for that, you would require IHE. So you also get access and the ability to provision the other cloud applications. I hope that makes sense. What I want to show now is basically the, the first scenario, the cloud only scenario. That's basically what I have prepared. But again, it works in, 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 in each of them. So today I'm really just going to show you how does it look like in IHE. And let me go there. And for this, I'll just go directly into the system. And we just go directly into success factors and we start in success factors. Let me just log on here. Just one second. And so what would happen here? Obviously, we as a IT person, we wouldn't necessarily you know, be in excuse me, in success factors, this would be what, H, what the HR department does, where they would, you know, add an employee. So we can here add an employee. And we will just do this now directly here. So, you know, if you've never seen success factors, I'm by no means a success factor expert. I just happen to have a, a system available that I can play around. And so basically, that's why I try to make this work. And but it might be just good for you guys also to just have it maybe seen once. But so basically, what, what do I do here? In success factors, to add a new employee has a couple of steps. That's also again fully configurable um, in your success factors. But basically, I just have a couple of um, <coughs> mandatory fields, and this is just a demo landscape I'm using. This is sales demo, um, and that's basically I, I hire someone now for one of my companies, and then here I have different events 
for you know why I'm hiring and, uh, and you know different events and will be triggered into the access into IHE. We're just now taking a new hire. That's the event I have it configured, and we'll also see then how what 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 you know what will be pushed over to IHE later. So here we just give it a name. We call it webinar IHE. A couple of of mandatory fields are not not too many, just a few. Um, doesn't matter where the person is from. And then here in success factors, every person, every employee, and again, this is can be can be configured the way mine is configured. You know, we can we can define a person ID, and that person ID is now mapped to the SAP user ID. So here I can basically define the uh, SAP user ID if I want. If we if we cannot define that, and we need any logic in between that, you know, that to define a username, then we could use something like the uh, SAP MDI to generate that person ID. Here I just do it manually. So I just call it I just call it test 80. I know 80 shouldn't be available. And then we just continue. So we don't have to fill out everything. Just a few more fields. Uh, needs a nationality here. And I just do something here. It doesn't matter. We're not really after this these fields, but obviously certain information will come over to um, to the SAP system. So we we'll just quickly go here ahead, and I've done it many times, so I know which fields are required. There's just two more, and then we're we're ready. And so here, and now this is interesting. So here, what I can do in in success factors, and this is basically what I mentioned before. A lot of companies are going down the way that we're trying to define position-based um, uh, authorization concepts. And so obviously these positions are also available here in success factors. So if I build my authorization concept following a job function, and that job function is here a position, I can select a job function, like for example, business developer senior. And then that's that's also an information that's passed over to IHE. And based on that, and we will see that in a minute, based on this position, I do and control the role assignments. So I say here, this person I'm hiring is a business developer senior. And we'll see what this means in, in, in a minute. And I just go ahead here. There should be one more field here, first day. We can define the manager as well here. That would then be read you know, from, from an approval process. I haven't activated that, so it will just come to me as a, as a manager so that we can, I don't have to jump between sessions, but obviously this would also be one thing that will be read. And then we just say submit, and now HR completed the task, a person was hired. Okay, so we're here, just takes another second, not the fastest sometimes. Okay, it was faster in the morning because I was trying, I want to make sure it, it's, it's working for the demo. Here we go. Okay, so here we can now see the, the person I just named the webinar IHE was now hired. And now let's log into um, IHE because now the task in HR is complete, or at least to that uh, a point complete. And now the information will be passed over to um, IHE. Now, how does that work? I log on to my IHE. I'm logging on with signals and on. So this didn't work. I'll try it again. Okay, here we go. So this is my IHE. For those of you that haven't seen it, it's obviously a cloud-based application. You know, everything is in Fiori. And let me just uh, quickly talk through this. I mean, I had a couple of webinars already about IHE, more, more details. But basically in IHE, how does it work is it's it's uh, it's based on jobs. So very similar to Access Control where we have different jobs. We also have a job scheduler where we can schedule different jobs. I already have one scheduled for the HR trigger, so we don't have to reschedule unless it's not running, because the the um, the smallest increment I can have it running is every six minutes. So we'll just see um, how long it will take until it runs. Yeah, so basically the next run is in three minutes. So I'm not patient. I'm not patient enough. So let me just quickly schedule it here. So basically, what happens or what we need is, and that's again, it's a recurring job that runs every six minutes. Um, but as I said, I'm not patient enough, so I just quickly run it um, ad hoc. And so basically, it's, it's a job 
you know, from, from a type HR trigger that now is connected to my success factor system that's now picking up those events. And let's just see. We go back into the job history list where I was before. Now we can see here my job already completed. And here we can see that might be a little bit small, but this is just the way it is. We can see the job started. There was one user change entity. And we can see here our user was basically triggered from success sectors with the event reason hire new. So this is basically a new hire. This is the, the event reason that we receive. And then we can see there was a business rule applied. And we'll talk about business rule here in just a minute. So basically, I have a business rule in the background that picks up the information from HR, processes it, and shoots out an access request. Here we can see there was one business rule was added to the, to the user, and then the access request was created. And you know, that's basically what I can see here what request number it was. So this was basically request number 39. And you can see this happens automatically. Now, if we go into, and because I'm the manager now, if I go into my access request inbox, I can see that I have a request 39. It's an automated request from success factors. It's pending for the task or for the stage manager. You can see for which user it is for. And then I can see here what is requested. So we'll give it a second here to load. We can then see up here that it was requested for, this is basically for the user it was requested. So if I click on the user here, I see those emails. So this is basically the name. That was the email that I maintained. This is just the standard email I have in success factors, but this obviously comes from success factors. I didn't change it. Um, this, this all this information comes from success factors. We can also see it was requested by the system. So no one manually in the background doing this for me. This is truly coming from the, the system. And then we can see here now that here we have a business role requested. That's called business developer senior. This is the same position as I selected for the user in success factors. And now what I can do here, and maybe we just quickly do it. We can say, let's approve this. So we submit it. I am as a, as a, um, as a manager. I'm now approving this. And I have it set up in a way that it, it, it have a three-step approval. I have manager, role owner, and then security. Now we can see request 39 pending from role owner. Let me just process it very quickly through. So we can also see what's happening after this. So this would be the, the role owner of the role, which also happened to be me. So I'm basically everyone here. I do everything. And here, important, so the business role, because this is type business role, and the business role is obviously only available in access uh, in, in IEG. So this is not a technical role that we have somewhere um, in the back end. So we can see here the business role, this is the business role name, and that's associated with some access in the back end systems. And we can see it here. So I basically have one access here. I only added one, um, one technical role from one of the application, which is my S4 HANA test system. That's an on-premise application that I added to that business role. I could also have added success factors, access or concur or anything else to that business role. Here, I kept it simple. I just added one role, but again, could be, could be multiple. So I just processed this through. I could either approve and reject. It's always possible to reject, but I obviously just want to approve this. And then the last stage would be the security stage, which also happens to be me. Now we can see it here, security. What do we do? We also approve it. So we say here, submit as well. And then that access request is finally approved and now provisioning can start. Provisioning in, in, in IHG doesn't happen automatically. It's also a, a background job that I have scheduled. So in the next run, which the, 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 the shortest increment is also six minutes. So within the next six minutes, it will process this and then provision out to the backend system. We just, we, we just let it run and we'll, we'll check it here in a minute to just see that that user that we created in success factors also got created directly in, in the S4T system, which is my S4HANA test system. 
but let me show you a few other things that I was that I wanted to mention. So let's quickly go to those business rules because I was saying that when the HR trigger came into IHE, there was a business rule that evaluated whether whether or not this is a request to be triggered and then also what should be triggered. We can also say before I go there, there's also the ability to reprocess missed HR events or to see if there was something that didn't work. So if I go in here, we can see I have, I think, at least two in here that didn't get processed. So for example, here I had one test from earlier today, this was in the morning, where no business rule was selected. So I was I was requesting something and the the information that came over from I, uh, from success factors didn't meet any rule in, on IHE side. And we can obviously also see which of the fields were sent over from success factors. So by default, there's the 12, the 12 fields that come over, you know, where I can see the division, the business unit, I can see the user ID, I can see the, um, the event down here, where it's the new hire. And I can also see that position, you know, that, that was requested um, for that user. And that's a position, for example, I haven't mapped. That's why it didn't, it didn't trigger a business rule. Now I could obviously go ahead and update for this um, a position. That's also one thing I, we can quickly then do to show you. So we could update uh, something for this position and then reprocess it. And then also this user should be created. So let's take a look at those uh, business rules because that's that's very interesting. In the configuration section, we can jump into the business rules. You can also get to it from the uh, from from BTB from the um, from the backend basically, but we can also just exit it directly from the application if you're authorized. And in the business rules, what are the business rules? If you're familiar with the BRF Plus framework from Access Control, this is something very similar. It's not BRF Plus, it's just BRF Lite kind of. It's similar, but it's nowhere as powerful as BRF Plus because obviously also here, cloud application, we don't have the same flexibility as we have with BRF Plus. But from an approach perspective and how this works, similar. So if you know BRF Plus, then this shouldn't be too hard to uh, to follow. So here we can see I have different uh, what's what's called projects or rule projects. I have one down here. This is basically my my active version for the workflows. It is triggers the workflow, you know, which path it has to take and so on. It's kind of like the initiator rule. If you think back to access control terms, and then here. I have the rule for my HR trigger. So this is basically the HR field changes rule that I have. And how does this look like? Very simple to understand. So we basically have data objects, data objects in form of basically like a, a structure at the end of the day where I have input and output. So for example, the user HR fields is my input. If I click on it, we can see what it is. So here I have those fields. And there should be 12 in total that come from success factors into IHE. And this is basically a structure, and that structure has fields. And these are the fields that come from success factors. I then also have, if I go back here, I also have an access structure which represents my output. So here I can say, you know, if certain input um, matches a criteria, then I'm triggering an output. And this is the output. So here I can say, you know, for which system, for which role name or, or profile name or, or system name, I want to trigger something like, you know, if I want to uh, trigger a business role to be assigned, that's then basically what I can do here. So that, there's data objects for input outputs, and then we have basically rules. We have a rule set and rules. And if you look at that rule, I have here a success factor initiator rule, which is at the end of the day, a decision table. Decision tables for those of you that know access control, this is our daily bread in access control. And what can I do here? I can build a decision table. So I can here define what is the input. So basically if, if you know the a field meets or equals a certain value and another field equals a certain value, then I'm triggering for example, you know, the, the, a business role. And that's what we can see here. So here I have that rule-based assignment basically. So this is obviously something that needs to be built up. Um, 
but here I'm using for like the, the new hire, which is the event called hire new. And if there's a certain position that comes from success factors that we selected when we, when we added the employee, I'm triggering a business role. You see here, I, I did, you know, very cheap, just the position basically equals that business role. But that's ultimately, you know, in, in we want to simplify this as much as possible. And this is what we can do. Obviously, we can also say here, um, you know, if it's if it's a new hire, we don't care about the position. We just want to, we just have one business role that gives space access across the entire landscape. That's also possible. But we can also do that more rule-based approach and say, okay, if that and that, then trigger that, you know, to really specifically assign certain access based on the input from um, success factors. Now here, obviously, we can see the one that I was showing earlier that wasn't processed is because the position wasn't maintained. So what would I do here? Obviously, I would have to, um, you know, add on in here. So I could say here, you know, copy this row and then paste the row. Let's just do this very quickly. We just say paste after, and I can just change this. So I can say, okay, what's the input? And I copied and pasted it. So I have it available here. So we have, for example, a different position. Now I change the position here to 2027. And then, you know, if this is, then we trigger, you know, for example, this business role or another business role. Okay. Um, here from different types, we can trigger um, different types from uh, systems, groups. We can trigger um, the business roles, which is for BR. We can do TR for technical role. Um, and also groups and profiles are possible to be triggered directly from here. Business roles obviously don't have a system. That's why the system is empty. If you're triggering technical roles, then like for example here, this is a role directly in the S4 team in my, in my test, S4 HANA test system, then we can also do it this way. Um, and I'll just, for this one, I'll just trigger the same role here. And then all we do here, we basically activate this and we have them to deploy it. So this is basically a rule that needs to be deployed. So we can go here into our uh, rule service. This is the rule service calls my rule set and then the rules. And I can say I deploy this, deploy to my cloud runtime, which is my IHE. And then the rule is being deployed. And now I have basically a new version and new rules. And so if I would reprocess those events, which I, which I can, then, you know, it would, it would pick it up and process. Let's just quickly take a look. So if we go back here, we go back to my reprocessed Mr. HR events from earlier. <laughs> we can see here that was the one that had no business rule. So we can just say retry. I'm sure I want to do this. So now it's basically in process. And the next time the HR job runs, it will process it. So we have just to wait here or then see when the job uh, you know, runs the next time within six minutes it will process this one as well. Before we look at this, we want to look at the one we created in success factor. So we want to, I want to show you that the user got into um, the backend system. So let's look at that. Um, what can we, where can we look at? Let's just go into the audit log of the request and let's, let's just see what happened. You can see here request 39, it's still in process. Um, it is still in process because it was submitted for provisioning. That's what I mentioned before. So we submitted this for provisioning, but it doesn't automatically provision. There's a provisioning job and it, it seems like maybe I haven't run it. So we just quickly run it manually. Again, same thing. We have a job. I use a job scheduler. There is a job that's called provisioning. And that's not specific to one system. This is just in general, whatever is ready for provisioning will now be provisioned whether that's into something in the cloud or on, on premise, it doesn't matter. The provisioning job will pick it up and start the provisioning. So we just say here, test IAG webinar, needs a name, we schedule, and this will now run. So let's quickly go to the job history. I know a shortcut, I can just go directly from here. Um, and then we look into the provisioning and you see there's different types of jobs, obviously, but this is not a provisioning job. So we check this. It's now running, already completed. And then here we can see that there was um, the job started. There was one item to be provisioned. And it was basically the system was an S4HANA system, a S4T. 
And then here I can see that a role, a technical role now, obviously, because this is not the business role that's being provisioned to the backend, it's the technical roles, which are part of the business roles, those are being provisioned. And we can see here, this particular role assigned to my SF test 80 user, my webinar IHG user, based on that business role that was requested from HR. And now the job is finished. So that build email means it's provisioned. So if we go out into my S4T system, which I have open here. No, I don't. Always a timeout when you talk too much. Just to quickly show you um, test 80, I think I called it. And then we can see that user was now created by my interface from IHE that that was just now so for the eastern people our servers are in in Switzerland that's why it's 7:45 p.m. this equals was just you know a minute ago and here we can also see now that the user got that one role that was part of the business role again i really kept it simple i only added one role here even an sap standard role it doesn't matter what you add there However, you change the business role, that's what will be provisioned. Here, I really just kept it simple. So that is basically um, how this works. Again, we have the entire audit log in, in, in IHE. So we can see here in the access request, if you go to the audit log, to the 39, we can see who requested. And here we can clearly see it comes from the success factor, user request creation. So this was a, uh, yeah. I, a creation of a user because it's a new hire um, all the way down to and the bottom here we can see that it was provisioned along the way we can see there was a manager approval a role owner approval a security approval you can see what was approved by whom and also at what time so it's always time stamped to you know fully have the auditability to understand who when what was approved and you know by, by whom that, that's fully possible. Those reprocessed events will always happen, I, I, I think, like in the day-to-day, -day because job changes, fields change, stuff like that. That's why it's, it's I think, pretty cool to have here the, the list of you know, what, was, what was failing. You can see the one that we had before is already gone. Now here we have another one where something is missing. And you can always see the fields that were passed over from, from success factors. So this really helps us to really see from you know an easy screen here why does why didn't it match obviously it, it, it doesn't show me which field wasn't matching whatsoever but at, at the end of the day the rules are simple then i can go back here and and match and see you know how this goes together and you know for all the reprocessed ones um we saw it in, in the access request quickly here now we have a request 40 that's in process that was just a reprocessed one so this is the IAG test from before the 17 again We'll just re, you know, again from success factors, just reprocess that. So that's ultimately how it works. So I think for the for the new hire, very, very interesting, especially for customers that have a clear authorization uh, concept, especially when you're following a job-based approach, because then we can map those jobs back to the position in success factors and really have a rule-based assignment of roles. We don't have to have the guesswork to see what and, and you know who could potentially use what it will just be provisioned or or at least requested automatically and then go through the provisioning process so that's that's from that perspective um very very interesting as i said this is the this was basically that the, the cloud only approach in in the simplest fashion where we have one success factor application um also where we define the user id in success factors, whether we, we type it in manually in the in the in the person ID field, then that's the user ID. That's the way it's mapped. If we don't type in a user ID, then it will just generate a, a, an ID, an internal ID of in success factors that will be provisioned. If that's a um, a problem, then like I said, we can do uh, certain things with the master data integration (MDI) in between success factors and IHE to, for example, generate user IDs and so on. Also, SAP is working in that direction to make it simpler, you know, from uh, you know how data flows back to the backend systems through the cloud entity services, through IHE, um, and so on. So there's a lot of things happening 
um, in, in Del Regard as well. At the end of the day, again, um, I have it here. What's important here is we have business rules that we can use. They're to some extent very flexible, so we can um, you know, build decision tables to validate what comes in and then trigger what is going out. And here I just put together you know, what can be triggered from you know, technical roles, business roles, composite roles, groups, and also you know, if, you, if you want to provision just a system application, you know, just a, if you just want to create a user, but if you don't want to assign any roles, that's also possible. That's basically what, um, what can happen directly from here. I hope that makes sense. I see we have a few questions. So let me see. Maybe Michael has it already prepared or answered. Hopefully he has it answered. <laughs> yeah, almost. No, but I'm ready to, to call them out and let you answer them. Okay, I can I can also read them myself. Um, so yeah, there, were, there were questions in regards to different functions that we didn't look at uh, today. Um, you know, one in regards to the to the, the privilege access management. Maybe I just I can I can remain here um, with with the Pam in regards to Fiori, and I think the question also goes into you know um, other cloud applications. Um, the firefighter, the Pam, works the same way as sub access control, the ID based firefighter. So basically, and I can also quickly show you this. So instead of instead of going to um, you, so we, we still have to log on to the backend system. So we only have the decentralized approach available. We don't have the central you know, in access control. We have decentralized and centralized modes that we can activate and, 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 and use. So we can log on to my GRC box to my access control and then connect to the backend systems. Um, with IHE, that's not possible. We have to go to the backend, for example, to my S4 HANA, and then I can start the firefighter from there. Now, in the past with access control, we had that GRC PI plugin, the NetViewer plugin to start transactions. So the transactions were in, in that namespace. With, um, with IHE, the backend component is part of the sub-basis component. That means we don't have to install a plugin, it's part of sub-basis. And that also changed the, um, the transaction codes. And top of my head, I have to look it up. They start with SIHE for, for IHE here. This is it. This is the launchpad. And so ultimately, the user at the end of the day starts the launchpad. And again, this is the transaction code here. Oops. The, SIHE, that's how it starts. And then here we would see the PAM IDs. So the capabilities are exactly the same as they were with access control. You have IDs provisioned to you, then you can check it out and it would start a new GUI session. And from there you can then do certain things. If you have Fiori and you have um, signals and on and so on, then same, same, um, the same um, uh, technical difficulties as we had before with access control. So that this doesn't necessarily um, uh, change. I hope that answers the question. Then there were a couple of questions in regards to you know how IHE compares to IDM. Um, you know I think from a, a identity management uh, perspective, sub IDM is going out of maintenance in end of 2027, if I'm correctly informed. Um, and at the moment SAP didn't commit to uh, IDM uh, beyond 2027. And in my opinion, I think IHE will be, to some extent, that, that product that replaces an IDM. IHE won't be the same as IDM was because IDM, you know, we were able to do a lot of uh, coding and, and, and all that stuff. We could really customize and, and, and define, uh, similar to access control, where we can you know, have access to ABAP and we can change code and write our own code. That will not be possible in IHE. So I'm not necessarily sure where the journey is going. I kind of think their SAP is planning on widening what, what IHE offers, more flexibility. The business rules, as I was showing, they, they, they're going in that direction because with that, I can already do certain scenarios, you know, what if then and so on. So I, I kind of think it will be somewhat uh, like an IDM or at least the, the plan is going in that direction. But again, SAP hasn't committed to anything uh, just yet. Um, okay, what else we have? There was a, a question about MSMP. So the MSMP, you know, multi-stage, multi-pass, as we know from access control, that's not available anymore in 
in, in IEG. So we don't have that. We, we have the business rules where we can define similar to like an initiator rule, but the workflows are given by templates. So there's templates we can upload. Okay, I also quickly show this. Um, there is uh, templates in that you know we, we can use this custom custom templates that we can create and here you can see so there's different predefined workflow templates again we can upload our own i haven't to be very honest i haven't really tried building my own templates just yet because that's only available for a, a little bit i just played around with the existing ones but there's different templates available you know where we have you know just a manager approval just a roll-on approval just a security approval or you have manager and security we have manager and role owner and so on. That's um, predefined as part of a template, but it's not like it was in MSMP where we had all the different capabilities to map and route and detour. That's that's not possible um, in 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 IAG. Um, then there was a question in regards to the rule sets, access risk analysis. Um, you know what are the differences? At the end of the day. IHG is a new tool, it's a new application, new platform. So that basically means the, the, the rule engine changed, you know, obviously changed, it's a new code base. The way that the rule that is maintained is slightly different, but at the end of the day, the same as access control. So you can basically use your access control rule set and bring it over to IHG. We cannot directly upload because the structure from the upload files is a little different than it was in, in access control, but the content is the same. So the rules, they, they still work the same. We have the functions, we have the risks, we have you know, critical authorizations, SODs, that is still the same. It's just the structure, how we upload and those file-based, you know, if you have if you have worked with the file-based uploads, that changes. So the structure is a little bit different. Then in the same, uh, you know, in regards to rule sets, so SAP pre-delivers rule sets for um, success factors, there's one for Ariba, there's one for um I would have to check in the in the in the help guide, but for for the for the most common cloud applications, SAP offers standard rule sets. You cannot, it doesn't have like an access control, we had the the BC sets, the business configuration sets. Um, that's not available, so we have to request the rule set to be implemented by SAP. It's basically an OSS node, you have to open and then they will implement that for you and then you have the rules available that's just the, the process it is um in my in my experience that works very smooth um all right what else we have it's a couple let me just quickly browse through there was a question regarding um analytics cloud sac SAC is also now um, really or does, does integration into SAC as well. Um, the the best there, I always recommend to check either the in the in the roadmaps. So if you don't know uh, roadmaps roadmaps.sap.com, you can go into the roadmaps and there you can see what's uh, what's coming next, what is already released. If you search for just identity access governance as a product, you can basically see. Um, the roadmap it's not showing too much right now and here you can always see you know what are the latest and greatest that they're adding also what's planned for the future um this is one link which i can also include in, in the powerpoint that we will send out and then the other one is, is just the help site so use helpsup.com what i always do i just search for ihe here then i go to the product and then in the product there is the easiest way to get to the to the to the help documents you want is you go to implement and then you uh, almost say use now where is it discover oh did they change it they must have oh did they change it look different yesterday um and or you can just search here for the product and then you will get it but there's integration scenarios there's actually i don't know where they they moved it I don't know where they where they hit where they hit it. Sometimes they're just hiding stuff and then we don't find it anymore. But um yeah, the, the help page is, is the way to go. They have one, it's called integration scenarios. It used to be on the right on the on the on the start page, 
where you can go to the um, integration scenarios. Where do we have it? And here I'm in the wrong section. Sometimes very sometimes tricky to find the, the right the right things here on the help portal, but you will find it. Here it is. Now, wasn't I just there before? Here's integration scenarios. And then here you can basically see you know, what are the applications that they're, that they're supporting and also what they're supporting. Okay, so, so from here you can see whenever they release, they, they also in the release notes, you will see what's new. For example, Analytics Cloud here, you can see it, it's available. Um, and then you can also see what processes they support, um, you know, how you have to set it up and so on. So that's always up to date on, on, on the site here. Um, then maybe last question for today. Um, one question in regards to UAR. Obviously, UAR is also available. It's it's called campaigns in or it's part of the access certification services. And then what it, it's called campaigns in, in IHE. We had UAR before, now it's just a campaign we can start. And the campaign would be something like you know, user access review, where I can have the manager or the role owner review the assigned authorization of the roles, all the access, and then have an approval. But we can also obviously you know, reject or, or remove uh, existing um, assignments as part of the, of the review, very similar to the user access review in access control. And I think with that, Michael, unless you see something I haven't touched that's super important, if I missed one, I apologize. We'll, we'll try to follow up by email, but since we're already over the hour, over time. Yeah, I think you covered the most important ones and um, I Perfect. think we are already over the time. We want to make sure we appreciate and respect everyone's time. So I think we're going to wrap it up today. Again, if you didn't, if you didn't answer your questions, um, just shoot us a quick email, let us know um, if there is anything else. Uh, keep an eye out for the link to the recording. And with that, we appreciate your time today. Thanks, Alessandra, for all the good knowledge here that you shared with us today. And uh, we hope to see you in the next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Bye.